Well, welcome to Ask the Experts, the Tri-City Regional Chamber of Commerce's series to help business leaders grow their companies with practical advice and answers that you can implement right away. And a special welcome to those watching on Zoom today as you're a valuable part of our audience. And hello watching in YouTube in the future. I always like to ask, how's the future? <laughs> okay, my name is Paul Casey and I do leadership and team development at Growing Forward Services. And I'm the executive director of Leadership Tri-Cities and privileged to be your facilitator today. This is a free benefit of your chamber membership and it couldn't be possible without the generous sponsorship of STCU. With us today is Tim. Come on up here, Tim. Thank you for representing today. Stand by the cool banners, thank you, Brian. Beautiful. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tim Brigman from STCU. I'm the home loan mortgage uh, officer there. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining uh, Ask the Expert today. STCU is committed to continual learning and development. And that is why we appreciate our partnership with the Tri-City Regional Chamber of Commerce. Uh, our two experts today will be sharing a wealth of knowledge that will help our business avoid HR mistakes. As a manager myself, it's a great uh, it's great to be part of a community of professionals that take time to support and educate each other. Thank you all for being here today. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Thank you. for your support of Ask the Experts. So here's how it goes down. We approximately half of our 90 minutes together. Our experts will be presenting their gold nuggets on the topic of HR pitfalls to avoid. And then for the second half, they will answer your questions. And if you'd like to ask, ask a question, we would encourage everyone to think of at least one question to ask the experts and Zoom people. I'm counting on you today. You got to come through with the questions, right? So you got you got 45 minutes to think of a question. You can text me um, and we'll put that up on the screen here in a sec. There's my uh, cell phone number. Yes, I give up my cell phone number because <laughs> I want your questions. So 509-392-1895, you can open a text now. If you want to stay anonymous or if you are uh, online, you can shoot me a text. If you're here in the room, you can, of course, just raise your hand and ask a question um, or type it into the chat. And then uh, I will vet those and get those to our experts, getting to as many as we can today. Uh, both of our experts' contact information uh, is on handouts or in the back of the room, and we'll also be emailing everyone after this as well if you want to follow up with them following the session. So let me introduce our speakers today. Renette Filmer is a seasoned leader and HR professional with an impressive 30-year career that spans both the public and private sectors. Her dedication to enhancing workplaces and communities is evident through her roles as a city council member and commissioner for the Housing Authority of Kennewick, where she actively contributes to shaping local policies and improving living conditions. As a board member of the Columbia Basin Society for Human Resource Management, SHRM, and director of programs, Renette has become a driving force in advancing HR practices and professional development in our region. Her expertise extends beyond her roles in public service. She also excels as a leadership coach, trainer, and speaker, specializing in areas such as communication, connection, and generational leadership. Her profound passion lies in fostering strong connections between HR professionals, their teams, and their workplaces, all while guiding them to see the bigger picture and navigate the complex terrain of the modern workplace. Laura Flores is an enthusiastic, entertaining, and informative presenter on both corporate issues and leadership topics with over 20 years of experience in the field of human resources. She offers a special blend of knowledge, experience, humor, and interaction to custom presentations and trainings. She's not your typical business team and individual growth expert. Laura has the unique ability to provide actionable answers to individual and organizational challenges in an entertaining and impactful way. She's also a community leader, current council member in the city of Grandview, a valued board member across several nonprofits, current board member of the Main Street Grandview Association, and a dedicated mother and friend. Let's welcome our two experts. All right, so today we're here to talk about the pitfalls that we fall into for with HR. And we are going to start with talking about the pitfalls of recruitment. So who's having issues with recruitment these days? <laughs> yep. Anybody online having issues with recruitment? You can type that over to Paul there online. So the so 
this is probably not more pitfalls, but kind of, you know, some off the wall tips that maybe you haven't heard about recruitment, but there are some things that we do do with recruitment that we really got to stop doing, but I'm going to shift this one over to you because we're going to talk about why we need to recruit, recruit, right? Yeah. Recruitment's tough, especially when there's a lot of people looking for jobs, but you can't find the right candidate to fit the one that you're looking for. And that's always one of the toughest points, especially in HR um, or for businesses that don't have an HR department and they're just trying to bring somebody on. They need the person that's passionate, that has the skills, that can communicate well. And you think those would be 101 basic skills that people have and not always. And if they do, it just doesn't match in the way that you need them in your organization. So that makes it really tough. Uh, one of the things that I know I've struggled working in a corporation and out now doing consulting, recruiting for other organizations is the company culture. That's super important when you're recruiting it's they're your customer, you're bringing them in, you're doing this first meetup, this is what I'm about, and you have to make sure that your company culture is really attracting the people that you want. And a lot of times organizations, small businesses, they're not too sure what that company culture is. So when I go into organizations sometimes and I'm asking them <laughs> questions, what are you about? What do you stand for? What are your values? What is it like to work here? not everybody in the same organization gives the same answer. And that's where you need to make sure that you're aligned so that you know who you're recruiting and in what manner. So that's one of the pitfalls that happens with HR and the recruitment. You're recruiting someone, but you're not sure what your culture stands for. So it's really hard to get somebody that matches that. Yeah, and our candidates are our customers. And so I think we forget a lot of the times that we need to provide the same customer service to them as we would a customer that comes into our environment. And what happens when we don't like a restaurant that we go to? We have a bad feeling about that restaurant. We, maybe the food was bad, the service was bad. And that represents as we go through the recruitment process too. So if we have a poor recruitment process, I have a friend right now that's going through the recruitment process with some really big companies on some really big HR jobs, like, you know, uh, like Eventbrite, like big companies like that. And um, the recruitment process has been awful. And so she, through the recruitment process, has either pulled her application or was glad that she didn't get the job because the recruitment process was so bad. So we have to realize that we may treat our customers really, really well, but they're our customers too. So the ads, the things that we do during that recruitment process represent our company. And so those are the pitfalls that we sometimes fall into is that we don't represent our company well when we are going through the recruitment process. Now, the second part is, is what do our ads look like? Are they, do we have a culture of trying to be fun and we're trying to create a fun culture with this ad here? And ladies and gentlemen, this ad here was done on AI. All I did was HR manager, a fun environment, good culture, and it. this is what came up. All the emojis and everything are what came up. And so I want to show you how handy AI is these days because you could really create a really fun, you know, energetic or whatever your culture is. If you have a culture of, you know, you have scientists, if, I don't know if anybody's working, at the, I don't think anybody works at the lab, but if, you know, they work at the lab and you want to put, you know, we want a scientist to put into blah, blah, blah culture, whatever your vision is, just put your vision and mission statement in there and let it plug in for you when you do your ad. So ads are important. And when we look at ads and they're just the same old, I mean, I'm looking at HR manager ads right now because I'm recruiting for an HR manager position and they're just the same ad. You know, it's the same ad that everybody has for HR. So we got to make it a little bit different than the rest, but we also want it to fit our culture and our environment. I was reading that ad earlier and I was like, where is this? <laughs> I'm like, hey. It was, AI does such an amazing job. Might as well let them do a lot of the heavy lifting yeah. for that. But it is true as uh, clients are asking, hey, can you help recruit? I need a job posting, an ad, and it's really dry. Like what's going to, mm -hmm. what? how is that one going to stand out from all the others that are similar? So it catches the attention of the person that you're looking for. And that one does have to match your culture and have some kind of something that brings the attention. And the younger generation, they like emojis. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. this one's full of emojis. You could probably go back on this AI and say remove emojis and it would probably remove the emojis too. But I thought it was, I mean, there's some good stuff in there. You're not just an HR manager. You're a culture visionary. You're, you're someone who blah, blah, blah. So I thought it was pretty cool. Hey, I did a job description today with AI. 
I, it was a job that I didn't know anything about. So I thought, I'm going to put this in AI and see what comes up. And then, so I did it, it all came up. And then I looked online at a couple of job descriptions and it was exactly what it was online. I was like, wow, that was impressive. Added a few things to it, but AI is awesome. So chat GPT, who's, who's used AI in here? Love it. Yeah, it's awesome, huh? It's easy. Okay, so reevaluate education experience and criteria. When was the last time that you went back and looked at a job description and said, no, maybe we really don't need a bachelor's degree for this position? Yeah, because we're getting to this point that we are having a hard time hiring, so we're reevaluating. So reevaluating that experience criteria. Do we need, really need someone with a degree? Do we really need someone with management experience or do they have enough soft skills that they can promote into a position? So I'm hiring for uh, a company right now for an HR manager. And one of the things that I talked to them about was, are you okay with a senior HR generalist or an HR generalist that has several years of experience that maybe isn't able to promote to a manager position because their person's been there forever and it's gonna be there for another five or 10 years. And so being more open to looking at people that have the experience, but also have the soft skills and skills and committing to them to help them develop throughout that is going to be important. Did you want to add to that? Yeah, I know that um, in the 20 plus years sitting in interview panels, trying to um, recruit for these positions as you're sitting there, there's some amazing candidates. Their communication skills are on point, their soft skills, interpersonal skills, all these things. And for some reason, they're just not going to degree. They got some, some college in and they just don't have those letters behind their name and they're automatically disqualified. And later you find out that the people that you bring in aren't always the best fit. So more and more what I'm finding is experience and people that have those soft skills, those interpersonal skills are going to make it a long way. Not that the degree is not important or not required, uh, but sometimes we really have to ask ourselves like, but do we need it? Like, is it mandatory and necessary? And if it is, because sometimes, like you said, if you're a scientist, most likely yes. But if it's something else, if you're really dealing with people and humans and leaders, uh, a lot of that is life skills, skills you learn over experience. So definitely would take a look again if that is a requirement because sometimes we limit ourselves to who our candidates are because of that. So and we pass, sure. miss out on really good candidates sometimes that have really good soft skills that can learn the job. Yes. Uh, soft skills are hard to learn. Hard skills are easier to learn. What they say. Also, you know, does it need a certificate? Does it need 20 years of experience? What is it that it needs? You know, I see a lot of HR jobs and they require, you know, a PHR, or SPHR, or any of that. And I'm just like, um, did you take your certification? No. Okay. Well, let me just tell you. Does anybody in here have their certification? Do you have your certification? You're in HR. It doesn't do anything for you. Like I didn't, I learned nothing from my certification. <laughs> I don't want to agree, but I would agree. <laughs> like I already, I had 30, you know, when I did it, I had 20 years of experience. So I was just like, okay, I'll take this. this you know, nice. I was looking at the test and it's asking some questions. Like we wouldn't do that. Like, you it's, know, it is very, some of it's subjective and some of it is experience. Like you're in the role, you're well, doing the work, you're seeing what's happening, you know, and sometimes that doesn't always equate with the black and white, you know, certification of how you're supposed to do something yeah. organizationally. Uh, sometimes you have to gauge in, in your company and see what the best thing is uh, compliance wise yeah. to do for your own organization that's going to help your people so agreed yeah it is it's uh best practices and i'm like that is not the best not like in the perfect time. world what perfect world do we ever have <laughs> anything <laughs> happen in hr we're like well every scenario is different mm -hmm. yeah every time so i'm sure there's if there's people out there they're probably over there saying paul i don't know who this lady is but <laughs> <laughs> these are experts he is a very generalist specialist can you explain that real quick yeah, so a generalist does uh, more, well, they can be kind of the same. It's how they define the job description, but, and you can chime in. Mm -hmm. Generalist it pretty much does everything across the board. So, but they usually will do it at a higher level. So they'll do benefits, pay, uh, they may do coaching and counseling. They may do leadership training. They do, you know, employee relations. And then a specialist is probably... Uh, learning some of those generalist roles and maybe they are focusing in just one area like benefits or they're focused on payroll or job descriptions. 
yeah. maybe labor labor relations. Yes, like that. I work in an organization with the same thing where you have a generalist and they're doing something for an employee from the beginning of their employment cycle to the end. So from the recruiting, the interview and the hiring, processing in the information systems, uh, coaching, training, all the way to maybe they have to do a termination. So they do the full spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I've had specialists just really focus like you're the benefits person and that's what you do or you're the data entry person and that's what you do so there's uh sometimes a little different both are really useful mm -hmm. um i'd like to lean towards a generalist one because they could do more and two you're training them to learn more so that they are marketable later on when there, it's time to grow whether in your company or outside of that uh, so they have more experience because sometimes if you get stuck in one spot you yeah. don't get all the other things yeah and that makes it hard for employees very true the other thing that our pitfall that we see is too long of a recruitment process, maybe too many people in an interview. If you're going to have a panel interview and you're going to have more than two people on your panel, the panel interview, we were talking about this later, is that you really need to let the candidate know that you're going to have a panel of six people. For somebody to walk in and have a panel of, you were saying, nine people yes. one time is a lot for a employee, right? So maybe you're doing a panel of nine people because you're trying to get all the interviews out at, at one time. So you don't want somebody to keep coming back for interviews. If there's going to be two interviews, letting people know that there's going to be two interviews and kind of what the process is going to be. Also, making sure that you are uh, not having a long uh, application that they have to fill out along with a bunch of questions that they have to fill out. So the public sector is still really famous for this of having to go through a whole application, still filling out all of your employment history. They want an easy apply. That's all there is to it. They just want to push a button and say easy apply. And it makes it easier for them to apply for more jobs at one time. Now, LinkedIn has easy apply. You can do easy apply on Indeed. I think most platforms have easy apply. Indeed also will allow you to ask some extra questions um, on easy apply. So easy apply and then it'll, you can ask if you're a U.S. citizen, those types of things, if you need to know those. But they like the easy apply button. So if you're still going through and requiring all of that information, really need to streamline your process to make it fast and easy because they'll just go on to the next job that they can't easy apply. Yeah. And I just had uh, someone call me uh, Thursday. Or do they still do this? I have to do application and a resume, then a cover letter, and then my references. And, and I'm like, she goes, this is just for the application. If I get a call back, there's this whole process and it does become cumbersome and it might be off-putting to some candidates that might be really good people that you want to hire. And they're just like, oh, it seems like a lot because sometimes yeah. it is, why do I have to, the stuff's on my resume? Why do I also need an application? Yeah. So there are some things and some are still manual. Yeah, I know some, you know, they're not automated. They're not um, online. We don't have a software system that uh, their application information transfers over to their new hire information, which is amazing. They can e-sign. There's a lot of ways to make it easier for the employee, the candidate to become an employee and sometimes making it more cumbersome. Um, that's their first experience with you. Yeah. So it's just something to consider. And then the other one is, you know, the younger generation likes text messaging is instead of calling them to set, schedule an interview, if you can't get a hold of them through a phone call, is text them, and they're more likely to respond through some text messaging than they are via calling you back. So you may have, let's see, I think that was, oh, and then reputation, you know, it goes back to your reputation, how you are seen in the community is also gonna be how people perceive you as an employer. So if they hear that you're, great to your employees, they hear that you're great to your customers, then they're going to want to come work for you, right? So you've got to really put out the reputation of the company uh, for employees are your biggest uh, representation of your company. If your employees like working there, they're going to tell other people and that's going to get out in the community and that improves your reputation. Anything to add on recruitment? Yeah, that's pretty good. Any tips and tricks that you guys have that have been working well? Can I ask a question about uh -huh. okay. the, the texting thing? I've, I've worked in some different places that provide cell phones uh -huh. to use to text and that kind of thing. Well, the, the one I'm at currently now does not. So if I have to text yeah. employees or potential employees, I have to use my personal phone. And you know, it's kind of like sitting on a thumbtack. It makes me a little uncomfortable yeah. to do that. I'm not <laughs> thrilled that everyone like Paul was saying, you know, hey, here's my number. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not overly thrilled about doing that. So, you know, do you, 
do I approach the, the, the ownership of the company and say, hey, a lot of our candidates would prefer to receive texts. Can we get a phone? Um, you know, something like that, because I I agree. I don't like it because I'm an old part, but I, I agree with it. Yeah. But I the only way I can do it right now is by the use of my own personal phone. Can you text great. through uh, ND? Can you email the text? Yeah, there's a couple of programs that you can. Oh, you can do email the text. Mm -hmm. Oh, you put their phone number in there, right? Yeah, you can send an email from your Outlook. Uh -huh. to, uh, sorry, to do a text message on someone's telephone. I think you just need another provider. Mm -hmm. So there are certain things like that, but there also uh, sometimes I had a uh, organization that would for recruiters they would get a phone and it was specifically for making those phone calls, those inquiries where it was like a direct line, especially when they were outside of their office. And then that's how they would text because in this generation, a lot of people just why are you calling? Send me a text. Like who calls yeah, <laughs> these days? Exactly. So send me yeah. the text and having those, like you said, the email to text, or if a company wants to invest in the recruiters or whoever is going to be making those phone calls, sometimes it's a stipend that they give for that, or they just have the phones. They're pretty cost effective to get a few phones for certain positions to have for those reasons. So those are a couple options that you can use, but I'd really like the you're at your desk and you're texting, but not for them it's a text, for you it's not, and it works out both for both of you. There's a uh, there's a platform called 8x8, and I don't know if it's free for like one line, you might check it out. It's 8x8 and it's, uh, it's a, you have a telephone line and you can actually have it go to your personal cell phone and then you can text and stuff off of there too. Um, and then you just delete the app when you're no longer, so they don't get your actual phone number. You have a phone number and everything that goes with 8x8. And you might get a free number off of that. I'm not sure. Are you saying 8x8, eight eight, like the number 8? Yeah, 8 and then, yeah, like 4x4, 8x8. Four four, <laughs> and yeah. emojis are optional. Yes. <laughs> All right. So on to onboarding. Onboarding. Okay, so now you've gone through the recruitment process interviewed, I interviewed in a panel of nine people, each sitting at their own desk. It was weird, but okay, let's do this, you know, kind of thing. So we're on, right? It's time to onboard. The offer's been uh, sent out and the person said, yes, I'd like to come work for you. So now we're gonna onboard. And really the what that means, it's just the introduction and integration of this new person into your company. So it's like uh, welcoming somebody to the family. I don't really like to use that term, but like just welcoming somebody in and then all the procedures, all the processes, all the paperwork that comes along with it. So that's really what onboarding is. Now, what happens, uh, this is information is from SHRM, which is a Society uh, for Human Resources Management, but it typically costs, and this number I feel like is very conservative and low, mm -hmm. but over $4,000 to hire a new employee. So by the time that you're putting an ad, a posting, the time of the people that are putting investments into that, scheduling the interviews, and that cost doesn't include the time that someone's out, that someone has to cover and fill, that work is not being done, that products aren't being sold, whatever the case. So it is a very costly thing to have a vacancy and then to hire somebody on. So once they're on, we want to make sure we pick the right person and that we make sure that they try to stay as, as much as we can have the control over that. Then nearly one in five employees quit in their first week. And that's been a new one. I think you guys were just talking about like uh, just people not showing up for interviews, like several, just no shows, not like I'm not going to be able to make like just no shows. They're just not showing up. So now if it's that for the interviews. Now it's you're on and you're like, eh, I changed my mind. And they just don't show up for their first day or for their first week. They quit in their first week. So that's becoming more prevalent in, in what's happening these days. Not too sure why, but I know company culture and the experience that they have in this process has a lot to do with it. So these are just some stats. And this is straight from Sherm um, about part of the onboarding. And I just was going to ask a question on what kind of onboarding experience you've had either as an employee once coming into an organization or bringing someone in that's either been positive or negative. Anybody want to share their onboarding experience? I'll share an onboarding you want to know? Okay. Yeah, when you get there and you don't have a computer and they're like, oh, we're trying to decide if you need a computer or not. <laughs> and you're the HR director for the county. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if you need one, huh? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I had so yeah, there's that. That was my first. Thing. That was yeah. yeah. I had one, and um, I didn't know, but my direct supervisor was going to be out at a conference, 
for the first two days that I was there. And I also didn't have a computer or anything. And so I just read policies and procedures for two days. That was my, my onboarding experience. I had another one where it was the IT's office. They didn't have an office for me. And so it was IT's office. So IT cleaned everything off of the credenza and the desk and set up my computer. But I had like the desk drawers and everything were full of all IT stuff. So, oh. so having, you know, people's office space ready for them is really important. It's yeah. a very welcoming. So that job, I actually hired an HR assistant and that was like her primary responsibility is to make sure everybody had like a welcome basket, a plant, water, a computer. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So when I was working in California in our Cerritos office, um, I was I didn't hire this person. They got hired by HR, but um, they usually we introduce that new person to everybody in the office. It's almost like two hundred people there. So I remember meeting this person, and then we never saw them again. They just didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> they got hired, they, you know, got introduced to everyone and, you know, we have like the welcome stuff or whatever and all of that. And, they, and then we just never saw them again. It's just like, just yeah. show up the next day to work. Yeah. Yeah. So crazy. either they were intimidated or they, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're like, oh, this job's not like, for me. Person. Yeah. They just never showed up. Yeah. <laughs> like, we couldn't crazy. find them. Yeah. Gosh. And that happens. Yeah. Um, and it's tough. And I'll tell you, sir, about that. Uh, when we get further on in the onboarding about a couple of clients I've been working with and they're onboarding experience of their employees. So really, I just broke it down so we can kind of talk about it in chunks. And um, the first phase on the onboarding is prior to the first day. So they made the offer, they said yes. And so now there's all these things that need to happen before their first day. Uh, phase two, now their first day, and they're going to get some kind of new hire orientation. They're going to get trained and introduced. Like I said, the tour of meeting everybody, you move on to the next one. So now they're going to get some training, which is on their probably policies and procedures, job specific, those types of items. And then the ongoing support in the first 90 days, six months, year. So that's kind of how we're um, talking about onboarding. But for the first one, this is where you could lose them, right? So the offer's out, you they accepted your offer and you're good to go. You've already went through the interview process, uh, negotiated salaries, and you're completing the new hire paperwork. I've had a lot of um, candidates come in and say, how many more documents? How many more emails are you going to send me? How many more things do I have to sign? Because there are so many compliance things. And as HR, yes, there's certain things that we have to do. Um, but to find some kind of automated, consistent process where it's very systematic so that they can do what they need to do in a very quick, efficient way so that you can spend your time doing the people stuff because that's really what's going to get them to stay there. What's been their experience? And the experience isn't usually like, oh, this electronic system was great. It's usually not, that's not what they're saying. It's usually somebody like, oh man, that supervisor, she was totally one-on-one -on -one with me. She called me every week, making sure I knew the status of my paperwork. And that's really what they're going to resonate to. So building systems that are automated and consistent is very helpful to put that aside and not have to worry about those things and really connect with your new person. I think that's one of the things that we forget sometimes because we're going off a checklist. Did I get this? They're W4, they're I9. Did they sign this stuff? And you're going through these things and you forget to look up and say, hey, welcome though. Yeah. <laughs> that's something that uh, is one of the pitfalls that happens too is we're, we want to make sure that we do everything correctly uh, and completely and we forget that interaction person to person. The one thing I would add to on my on job offers, one of the things I added on the job offer letter was what to expect on their first day, like what to wear, do you bring lunch or will you have lunch? Are you are we going to be taking you to lunch? Like all of the things that because if you're going into your first day, think about how, what you would want to know on your first day and what you would want to learn on your first day. And I put a lot of that in the offer letter because it's something that you can just leave in your offer letter because most of it's the same unless you have you know, different positions and um, that do different things, then you can just do them for those, you know, all the whatever is appropriate for that job offer. But putting it in there and what that expectation is because it gives them, you want to know what to wear your first day and you show up with, you know, suit and tie on and everyone's in jeans and a t-shirt you know you're like oh okay this is well, nobody told me I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so putting what to expect those days. yeah I love that and then like you said it's just information that can stay in the letter and yeah. only have to be revised if you're in a different location different department type of thing mm -hmm. uh phase two it's one of my favorite pieces because this is where you really get to know someone and really have them know your company your organization is the new hire orientation so it's the first day you're like welcome Renette 
thanks for joining us. We're excited you're here. Well, how excited? Did I get a welcome basket? Do I have a computer? Like, <laughs> do I have the things I need to do my job? Is that how excited you are for me? And that's one of the stories I'll tell. I had a client that told me, oh my God, I had this person. She was amazing. Perfect hire for this role. Took me forever to find them. After day four, she quit. And I'm like, well, what happened? She's like, I called her and asked her, what can we do to bring you back? Why did you, why was this not a good fit for you? And like, you weren't ready for me. I didn't have a computer. I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. Nobody was really training me. Yes, I had a job description, but it was vague. So I didn't know what I should do. Do I have authority to do these things for four days? And I just, I can't. And so that was really tough. Like, so this is one of the reasons new hire orientation is important because you can have this uh, a player that you just hired that you're bringing on and then you go through your new hire orientation to make sure that they understand they feel valued important they also probably put it two weeks notice are taking the risk to have this new job so it really needs to mean something for them and this is the perfect opportunity uh, on their first day to do that so you do the tour I know one company um, would meet in the first week have lunch with a CEO and that's unheard of especially if you're a big company to be doing that with all your new hires but it was small enough where they could do that and huge response. They remember this years later. Oh, I remember my lunch with the CEO and they talk about it. So making those impactful experiences for someone that wants to stay on in that first week of that new hire orientation. Uh, introductions to their team. This is going to be your go-to person. Do you have any questions? Like, where's the bathroom? Do we do lunch on Fridays? Like, can we wear jeans? Like all these things, there should be a go-to person, a mentor, a job shadow, someone that's going to be their connector in case they feel a little lost that's going to be able to do that for them. Um, and then just as, this is the time where you have your overview of your culture. You have a list of this is what it looks like to be successful here. All of these things, A through Z, if you do these things, you're going to be an amazing player here. Here's what you shouldn't do. Like this might get you not to be on the team if this, because this is not what we stand for. And this is the perfect opportunity to make sure that that person's really melding in with the culture. You're going to find it right away in that first week if they're like, oh, we got to be respectful for others. Well, maybe we didn't make the best choice, right? So this is the time where we're going to find those things out. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. New hire training. This is also because I do a lot of training and development at in my role. Uh, training is important because a lot of times I see organizations do training. So they're like, all right, she got this. She knows how to do that. Check, check, and we're done. So you should know everything. And then that's kind of the mindset behind training is more of a checklist versus let's make sure you really are understanding what this training means and how it impacts the other departments, how it impacts our clients and customers, and what your role is to do above and beyond in quality and uh, what you need to do. So a lot of times the training lacks a little bit. They, a lot of people, one of the top three reasons people leaving is because they weren't too sure, they didn't feel trained or ready for their job. So training is really important. Not that you're like, yep, we trained them everything they need to do. Yes, but are they grasping it? Do they really understand? And do they know how that impacts what their their goal is with their clients, with the customers, with the products and whatever that is. Um, very important to do job specific, right? So if they tell you you're gonna be a customer service rep, what does that look like? What does that mean? When you're doing a uh, customer service rep type work, what's a player status? What's bare minimal? And then what is your, sometimes you talk about like a track that you want to do. How can I grow into this role and how can I go into other roles? And if you make it really clear for somebody, they're really excited to do a good job so they can get to that next level if you make it clear. Anything you want to add on that? Uh, I would add on the new hire training is, is in part of your training is have a document uh, prepared before the person that comes in that has like all of the software systems that you use, your acronyms, because it's nothing's harder than coming in and you're they're like, okay, you use eight by eight for the phone system that yeah, you have a phone, but you can use your cell phone. And then we also use, you know, high for project management. And then by the time they're done at the end of the day, they don't know, they know that there's a million of them, but they don't know which ones they use for what. And so what I would do, especially in HR, you know, we would have, okay, Hive is project, it's, that's where our project management, that's where we use our calendar. And then we use Google for, you know, it's like, have it, have it written out for them so that they can, they know what everything is. I wouldn't put it in the orientation packet. I would have it for the individual departments, create something that they give as their training so that the person kind of knows where everything is at. 
Yes. And along with new hire orientation, it's not a one time, let's train you, you're good, yeah. go do your job. We'll never have to talk about this stuff again. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It's always a lot of follow up. It's just like us learning a new skill, a new trait, a new anything. We're not going to get it the first time. We're gonna, we'll get the gist, but to get more specific, to do a really good job, we have to have some kind of repetitive. So the next part is that ongoing support. So when we talk about once, how you said you got the acronyms, got what systems we use, great. I'm still going to be lost for a minute. And yeah. then until I get it again, oh, now I'm understanding. I worked in healthcare for, for a little while, a long time ago, and they would throw out all these acronyms. I'm like, what are they saying? Is that the bad one or the good one? Like I had no idea. Like I really had to like have some people that are really trusted. Like, okay, what does that mean? Uh, because it, it gets a little, it's a lot of overload. So yes, give them orientation. So they get an, an awareness of what's happening and then you break it out into steps. So if they have to meet with this department to know how their job relates to that department, like if I work in HR, I really have to work closely with payroll because what I do affects what they do. So I'm going to meet with payroll. And then I also need to meet with the managers because I need to, so there's a lot of ongoing steps instead of front loading it in the first week is just let them learn over time so that it's, you're absorbing it, so you're asking questions and things are starting to connect. So that's the ongoing support, regular feedback, <laughs> regular check-ins. Um, another thing that I know employees, new employees tend to dislike is I never see my manager. I don't, mm -hmm. I do uh, hey, and they walk by like that's the extent of my visibility to my boss. Now, they don't always have the time, but for sure in the first 90 days, you want to make sure you're visible and asking, doing some check-ins, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one, let's meet, or it's just like, hey, how are things going? Do you need anything? How can I help? And just having that support available. And if it's not you doing the support as a supervisor, then delegating that, then making sure that they have what they need so that they can feel they have the, the things that they need to do their jobs, the tools that they need. Um, and then any mentors or job shadows. So a lot of times it, there's always some go-to person that's like, if I'm not here, ask Laura, she'll help you, you know, kind of thing. And just making sure that they they have somewhere to reach to as a resource. You think I'm missing on that one? Yeah. And Deb, Deb in the chat says um, they do their onboarding in groups. And they have a lunch with leadership on the second day. They provide pizza and the leaders come in, introduce themselves and welcome the new staff. Gives us an opportunity to them to meet management and HR is friendly and helpful. Excellent. Excellent. I love that. That is culture. Yes. Culture and schedule. Yeah. So it's scheduled. If you already know the second day we're doing this, here's what Eric Turner looks like. And all the, this is culture, all the executives, all the managers know this is important. We need to be there for these new employees. And that's already a step ahead of a lot of organizations that don't really grasp that yet. It's so important. I know it sounds like, oh, I got to meet these new people. Oh, you know, it really isn't. It really is a culture where like, you're important. You're the people that make this happen in this organization. And we're going to have lunch with you. We're going to meet you and here to support. And I think that's important. So whoever put that on Zoom, excellent job already. <laughs> and let's see. So here, oh, that was for me. Just to end the onboarding piece is just uh, Bamboo HR. They do was a lot of studies. Five? We didn't see phase five. Oh, there was only four. Oh, I thought there was only yeah, I, I put a slide in here that don't look at it. It's, I'm skipping it. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my talking points I forgot to delete. Uh, for here, though, uh, Bamboo HR is a really cool um, HR service. They do software, but they also do a lot of surveys. So they have a lot of information. And I wanted to throw some things out here just to kind of resonate what we just talked about with recruiting and onboarding is that 23% of people who left their jobs wanted clear guidelines about their responsibilities. If they would have had that, I think they might have stayed. So then that goes to the training, the job description, and understanding what your role is. 21% yeah. uh, expected more effective training. So mm -hmm. training's a big one. So just because you're training doesn't mean it's effective training. There's a difference. And then 17% said a friendly smile or a helpful coworker could have persuaded them to stay. And that one tells me culture, right? <laughs> That's a, e, who was not friendly here? So obviously, if you want somebody to stay, you've got to make it a place where it's staying. And what does that look like in your organization? So that culture piece is always on the foundation. It's underlying your recruitment, your onboarding, and your you know longevity with, with staff staying. So I, I love to use these real stats from HR doing these surveys on why people would have stayed. And uh, yeah, encouraging other on the 17% one, encouraging other team members that may not even 
work directly with them to come over and say hi and welcome. I remember I was at a job one time and I had a uh, employee, she wasn't even gonna work with me and she came over and introduced herself and you have any questions or you don't know where something is. And she was just like a line worker. Like, yeah, so takeaways, any takeaways? Or questions on the onboarding piece. Yeah, there's someone at PNL that I coach that brings a box of donuts on a new person's first day, and it makes everyone come to get a donut and meet the new person. Oh, so that's that's creative. Idea. Incentive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that idea. Anything to get that uh, camaraderie going. That's right. All right. So the pitfalls and employee handbook. So when was the last time has everybody updated their handbook in the last year? Our new one rolls out November 1st. Okay, good. So we're in that joyous commentary time. <laughs> um, how about last two years? Anybody commenting online? Yes. Last three years? It's been more than three years? So one of the things that's really uh, valuable for your employee handbooks is to have them flexible for your organization and your culture. We talked about culture with the employee onboarding. Now your culture needs to roll over into your handbook as well. So the energy, whatever it is that you portray to your vision, mission, and, uh, and value statements needs to roll over into your handbook. And so you wanna make sure that you're, you put a lot of flexibility in your handbook. It should be a general guideline. I recently went into an organization and I started looking at their whole onboarding process and their handbook was 105 pages long. So you, <laughs> your handbook should probably be around 45 pages long. Maybe 50 if you're putting pictures in it because it's, you know, you're trying to make it look colorful and stuff like that. But 105 pages was a lot of policies, a lot of procedures, which uh -huh. goes. <laughs> that should be policies only, not procedures. <laughs> right. So we want to make sure that we're not using, and we're going to talk about the difference between policies and handbooks so that everybody's clear on the difference between the two. But some of the pitfalls is using a lot of jargon that doesn't make sense or a lot of legal jargon that people don't understand. Some of the key words to remember in your handbook is, especially if you have performance evaluations, and this is the biggest area that I always see that is or increases, is one, I would never put that you do annual increases in your handbook because if you ever decide you're not gonna do an annual increase or you're gonna change that, the other thing is, is that if somebody doesn't get an increase, they go back to their handbook and it says, it says right here, I will get an annual increase. You may get an annual increase every year. May, will, shall, shall not. All of those words are important to leave some leeway. So if you're going to pick between will and may, you always want to go with may because it may happen, may not happen. When you do will, then that means it will happen. And uh, so making sure that you don't have a bunch of legal jargon that people don't understand in your handbook. Anything else you want to add to that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, they don't want it. You don't want it to be long and over detailed either, because this is just general information. The employee is not going to read. Some employees might read the whole handbook, but for the most part, a lot of handbooks are similar. So they're going to know what the general direction is. But that's also why you don't want a 105 page handbook. because that employee is going to be like, yeah, I'm never going to read 105 pages. And I would venture to say if for some reason that went to court, they would say, well, it's not realistic that your employee is going to read 105 pages of a handbook on top of all the other things. So handbook versus policy and procedure. And I don't know, are, do, you, do you send them the PowerPoint? Oh, okay. So you guys can kind of read this, but your handbook is going to be your general overall guideline of what your policies are. You're going to have some policies that are going to be in the handbook, like your, your harassment policy is probably going to be the whole thing is going to be in your handbook. If you have a work free, uh, uh, a drug free workplace, probably the whole thing is going to be in the handbook. I would say the exception to that is if you have some people that are drivers and not drivers and they have different rules around uh, workplace uh um, drug, a drug free workplace and they have to get tested and all that. You may want that in a fuller policy, not in the employee handbook. Your employee handbook, you want to affect the majority of the organization. So if you have specific areas that have specific things, then they need to address those when they're going through their onboarding. 
not through the employee manual. The, empl the employee handbook really needs to be focused on the general population of the uh, environment, not every single you know person within the organization or every single position within the organization. And then your policies and procedures, you may have some procedures in there as far as like attendance that you need to call and let people know if you're going to be late or, you know, how to ask for time off. So there's some general procedures in there, but your policies are going to be your more lengthy, lengthy documents that you can refer to in your policy. You do a, you know, high level overview of what that policy is. And then you can say, refer to drug and alcohol policy. Uh, data, you know, uh, for more policy, for more information located on if there's a drive that all your policies are located on or wherever they can find them. The key to this is that they need to have access to them. And if they don't have access, that's where you could, you're going to get in trouble with, you know, if they file a claim or something and say that they didn't know that, or, you know, they, whatever they do. But anyway, they file something. It's when they don't have access to that information. So make sure you have a drive where everybody has access to that. Now I do get times where people say, well, I don't have access to a public computer or there's, they don't have access to a computer. I would say there's got to be somewhere in the agency that you can have a computer set up that people are able to go and uh, look at that information. The other thing is, is are they clocking in somewhere, if they're clocking in somewhere, they obviously have access to a computer, or maybe they have an app on their phone. If that's the case, then try to find a place for them that they do have access to look at that information. Um, and maybe it's just a, a laptop that's set up somewhere that people can get into to look at policies and procedures. So what is the handbook for? And it was interesting, I asked this question on LinkedIn not too long ago. And everyone said it was a uh, policy manual or just rules and regulations. That is not what a policy uh, employee handbook is for. An employee handbook is one to sell your culture and what your culture is about, what the company is about. It's to market to your current employees. Another mistake that I often see in handbooks is people marketing to employees that are not hired yet within their handbook. And I'm like, why are we talking about I-9s in the application process in a handbook? Because they've already gone through that process. And so it's you're marketing to your current employees. So you want it to have a nature of your culture. So if it's really staunch and hardcore, and it's like, you may not, it has a lot of bolding and capitalized. Like I always take bolding and capitalized out of a handbook when I do handbooks for people because we want it to be friendly. We don't, you know, if we bold everything and, and capitalize it, then it sends a different message. And then uh, it does limit liability. So having a handbook that is outdated is awesome. It's about as big of liability of not having a handbook at all. If you um, have policies and procedures that have been updated and you haven't updated your handbook, your handbook still stands because your employees sign the handbook. And so if you've changed those policies and then you want to go back on them and you haven't updated your handbook, then that's where you have an issue. Now, the other thing is, is that it uh, that's where you need to be careful with your maze and wills and all of that stuff, because that's where you get into the liability. Leave your language flexible within your handbook. And then it should explain applicable laws that apply to the employee, like FMLA, um, Washington sick leave those types of things, what they are eligible for. And then it's an administrative time saver. If you can get your teams used to going back and looking at the employee handbook and what the benefits are or what the policies are and things, or even your managers will go back to the handbook and you know you can see the conduct that is uh, considered misconduct or what the process is for, um, for discipline. The other thing is don't stick yourself with the discipline process. Don't go from stage one, stage two to stage three. It really needs to say that you have flexibility to go into any stage. So if it doesn't say that you have flexibility to go to any stage of the process at any time, then they can go back and say, you terminated me, but your disciplinary process says that stage one is a written warning. And so make sure your language doesn't dial you into those and then I talked about uh, oh and then answers questions that that come up during employment. Anything you want to add? No, I was going to hit on that one, like with the wills and musts and that kind of stuff. Must you just put yourself that yeah. the discipline always comes up where it's um, 
step one, you will get a verbal and step two, and we're going to follow this process. But if they did something that was severe enough to go straight to termination or suspension or to a higher level, you, you kind of tied your hands on that one by not leaving that language mm -hmm. flexible. So you, you do have to give your organization some flexibility to adjust based on what's happening. Yeah. And um, on the culture of the handbook too, is that, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing to put pictures and like make it I appealing to the eye. I just did a whole handbook on uh, Canva and it is so cool. And it's like, you hit the little button, it goes to the next section and it's colorful and it's fun and it's, you know, and they're just so drab and so, you know, boring to look at. So the other, uh, I thought I had this in there. I think I do. So what the handbook is not for is what we already discussed, not for detailed policies. It's not a contract of employment. So you need to make sure that somewhere in there, it says this is not a contract for employment. However, we're gonna go over some NLRB stuff where it can be considered a contract for employment, but you should have no guarantees in there whatsoever. One of the areas to be careful of is people are still doing introductory periods, 90 day introductory periods. Uh, there's recommendations to change the language on that, but to make sure that people understand that even once they are done with their 90 day period, it doesn't mean that they are no longer at will. They continue to be an at will employee because it can indicate some language can indicate that once they are done with their 90 days, they can't be terminated. So make sure if you have that, I tell people to just take it out because you can term it where an at will state you can terminate at any time. They, you know, a 90 day period could be that you're going to get evaluated. That's when you're eligible for employee uh, for benefits, but not, I, I recommend people to take it out. That's kind of my, and then, uh, you know, using forceful language, violating the law. So uh, years ago, and this goes for policies too, this uh, company that I was doing work for had an employee handbook and they had they were in the uh, banking industry and they had an employee handbook that was saying that, you know, they couldn't be involved in uh, political activities uh, because of the standards of conduct within the organization and all of this stuff. And they're like, well, it's in the policy. And they came to me one time and they're like, well, she did this and it's in the policy. And I'm like, the policy is against the law. Like, make sure your policies aren't violating a law, right? Uh, and it's not a substitute for good practices, and it's not a substitute for managers to just say, here's your employee handbook, read this, and if you have any questions, let me know. I always recommend that you highlight some areas for them to go through, like what's misconduct? If I do something, what is it that I can do wrong, that I would do wrong that may cause me to be terminated or whatever it may be? What are some key areas in the handbook that I need to know about? And kind of go over those areas with them. And then one size does not fit all. So we get a lot of boiler hand plates. If you belong to Sherm, you can go on to Sherm and you can get a boiler hand plate. Let me tell you the mistake with boiler hand plates is that a lot of people will just take them and they use them and they don't apply to their organization. It doesn't fit their culture. I had an employee handbook that just came across that was a boiler plate handbook. The employer actually uh, didn't have some of the sections, like they didn't have benefits. So all they put was, the company does not have benefits instead of just taking the whole section out. So it had section after section of this does not apply to this company. This does not apply to this company. This does not apply to this company. And so um, boiler hand plates do not fit all. And there's a danger in boiler hand plates, especially if you're not making sure that they are up to speed with your organization, because you may be applying rules that you think are okay, um, and that you think should be put in place, but your company's not following those rules. That's another thing about your handbook. If your company's not doing it. So a lot of times I'll read people's handbooks and I'm like, are you really doing this? And they'll be like, oh yeah, we haven't done that in years. Okay, well, we need to take it out of the handbook then. And so some people leave it in there because they, you know, whoever wrote the handbook thought it was a good idea and this is a rule that we should apply. But logistically, it's not really, it's not good to keep it in there. Remember the liability of having things in there that you don't apply is a big liability. And then setting the right tone. Uh, don't make promises that you can't keep. Like don't say in there that you will receive an annual performance evaluation when maybe you don't do performance evaluations or sometimes they'll say you'll receive a performance evaluation at 90 days. Well, not every all the time do we give them at 90 days. So one size does not fit all. Anything else you wanna add? No, that's good. Okay. <laughs> and then 
So I always like to, when I go to redo a handbook, do you have any other practices? Do you have any other policies and procedures that may be in the handbook? You want to make sure that your policies and procedures are matching what's in the handbook. So that's another big mistake that happens is we update the handbook, but we don't update the policies. Or we update the policies, don't update the handbook. Another reason why it's easier to have a high level overview of what the policy is, because if you change the policy and it's in the handbook, you have to change the whole handbook. So uh, the NLRB does say that the handbook is retroactive. So if you change your policy, you have them sign off on the new policy and it's in the handbook, but you didn't change your handbook, the handbook still can stand. So it can be retroactive to whatever the handbook says. So that's why you want to be careful of not having all those policies in the handbook because you change one, got to change the handbook, have everybody sign it. It's a lot of work, right? And then using that wiggle worm, uh, wiggle worm, wiggle room language. Uh, uh, generally, we attempt to review your performance evaluation. We've talked about some of those. Uniformity and consistency. Everything needs to align, right? So it needs to align with your message, needs to align with your policies and procedures, align with what you, the message that you want to send to new employees. Yeah. All right. So that uh, in August of this year, I don't know if you all know this, but years ago, there was a law that came out around uh, the language that we should all have in our handbooks that talks about the at will language. And it also typically will say that no one else has the right to change this handbook or make a, another employment agreement with an employee except for the CEO of the company. Well, the law came out, basically said that uh, we needed to be careful because you can't violate an employee's right to unionize. And this is for any organization. So the NLRB applies to every organization, whether you are unionized or not. You have to, I had an employer recently when I was doing their handbook, they, under the confidentiality part, I had taken out the language that they use that they could not discuss wages within the workplace. That is a violation of the NLRB. They have right to a right to talk on social media. They have a right to talk to other coworkers about their wages, hours, and working conditions. So we cannot deny them that right to do that. We also cannot say that the CEO is the only one that has the right to change the, uh, a, the working relationship because they can unionize and then NLRB can come in and change that working relationship. So be careful on the language that you have. It's usually at the beginning of your handbook. Um, you guys will have this. So um, a handbook provision must be interpreted from the perspective of a, this is what I liked, <laughs> from the perspective of an employee who is subject to the rule and economically dependent on the employer and who contemplates engaging in protected conservative concerted activity. So the employee interprets, how the employee interprets it is what is important. So this goes for anything in your handbook as well. So there is some stuff out there about social media, what they can post on social media, what we can prevent and not prevent them from posting on social media. So doing some research with the NLRB. The NLRB has a section, and for some reason when I was doing the PowerPoint presentation, I couldn't get NLRB. I don't know. Their webpage was down for the day. I don't know what was happening, but there is a section in there that talks about handbooks and different language in handbooks. And it's similar language that we all use. And it'll say how the NLRB has ruled that this language is uh, not legal, but this language is. So it's like a slight tweak or cor correction. So if you're looking at changing your own handbook, going into the NLRB website and checking that out, um, you have to do some digging to find it. I couldn't remember exactly where it was and I couldn't get into it to, to share it with you all today. But um, anyway, so concerted activity includes yep, one or more coworkers about wages. So they can talk about wages. I know it's very frustrating. And then uh, here's, this was from Sherm, just some areas of um, warning from kind of the, around the NLRB laws of um, that use of social media and some other things to be aware of with your employee handbook, making sure that you're getting the right language in there. The other thing I wanted to share that I see in handbooks every once in a while and I recently saw is unless you're a medical provider or you're providing some type of medical care, HIPAA does not apply to employers. 
it only applies to you're in the medical industry, right? Yeah, to people that are in the medical industry and have access to client or patient information. So if I'm talking to Laura about an employee, um, it, there's not any HIPAA rules around that. So you don't have to have any HIPAA information unless you're a, a medical facility in your employee handbook, nor do you need to have a policy. So I see that every once in a while, that's a little crazy. So this, I, I could go over this in detail, but you guys will have this as kind of just some tips to make sure that you're checking out in your handbook and prohibits insubordination. So be careful on your misconduct. Uh, a lot of misconduct will say insubordination. Um, insubordination, you know, employees can now cuss at their managers or supervisors, and that is not considered insubordination. Um, there's, yeah, there's some interesting stuff out there recently. And it's tough to coach um, direct supervisors or managers on some of these new things, because they'll come up like, Laura, they're bad mouthing the company on social media. Yeah, I want to fired or you know what? This is we got a discipline. This needs to stop. And you're like, well, what were they saying? It was about wages, hours, working conditions. You know, there's rules on NLRB. It, it's really tough for a manager to kind of gain traction, but there are certain ways and certain um, ways you have to communicate that to try to get employees on there because there's a lot of protection when it comes to NLRB mm -hmm. on how best practices are and along with SHRM um, on how to maneuver through those things. And it's very frustrating sometimes to, to managers that are the frontline managers, like she just did this, you know, and you're like, oh, yeah, according to, you know, and, and it gets kind of tough. So I think a lot of that goes through, let's train our managers really well on what they can and can't do or the best practices to maneuver some of those situations. But again, that comes with culture, training them from the beginning as you're onboarding them, as you're training them, as you're telling them, this is how we roll here. We're very respectful. We very encouraging, you know, those kinds of things hopefully tend to minimize those situations because they are hard to maneuver through when you're a frontline supervisor having to deal with some of those situations. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any questions? Can you go back a uh, screen to all that shun stuff? Yeah. It seems like a lot of those are the exact opposite of what <laughs> you might think normally. We can't promote <laughs> stability within the organization. <laughs> Why not? Um, because I think that it goes back to the politics in today's workplace. So people have a right, freedom of speech, that's cussing at your manager or, you know, whatever that they want to do. So we can't, I mean, you could promote civility. I don't think you would want to do it in your employee handbook though. And you know, about the swearing at your manager, how how is that okay? I don't know. I, I am just telling you. <laughs> I know. Good question. How is that okay? Because that, that falls under the insubordination, um, what, where it says prohibiting insubordination is because people will call that insubordination instead of just bad behavior. It's not considered insubordination anymore. So you have to call it something else? Maybe. But I, I'm, my question is really Using the articles. Language, is, yeah. Are there documents or policies or something somewhere? That actually say that an employee has can do these things. I wouldn't tell them that they could do these. Well, things. no, I never. Would. Yeah, <laughs> and I put six think... foot four on them and fire their ass. Yeah. They, they would never get away with that. You know, but, I was a high school principal yeah. for seventeen years before I switched <laughs> over to HR. Thank and you. you know, sometimes you, you know you can do a lot of things that you need to do just by changing yeah. the tone of your voice. But some of, I mean, th these things are ridiculous. And I know a lot of things in the world are ridiculous right now, but come on, some somewhere there has to be a line that says you just can't do some things yeah. somewhere. Right. And I think and you that, can't be afraid of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that it's being careful what you do outside of your employee handbook and what you write in your employee handbook, I think is where you need to be careful. Because if you're in your employee handbook telling people that they can't, you know, they can't, that you're promoting civility that you can't um, have an opinion or that you can't so that it doesn't promote um, arguments in the workplace or you can't pick it or you can't, um, you know, talk to each other about joining a union or those things because it doesn't, because that promotes civility, right? Right. And if you're foolish enough to write yeah. your handbook like that, then you yeah. get what you've got coming. Yeah. But there has to be an understanding 
uh, what is okay and what isn't okay. Right. And that's how we raise our children. This is okay, this isn't. That's how most people raise their children. Yeah. <laughs> I think this language is uh, like an overly cautious yeah. based on case law that's like, what were they able to get away with? And I think it's just an overcall to just take a look at this. Definitely do not write your policies that way. Uh, that just know it's out there. Just know it's out there that if somebody gets to a point where they want to say, they told me I have to be civil, which means they were shutting down my voice in yes. order to talk that. I think that's just the overly cautious yeah. way to say those things. Uh, and it's just more of an awareness. Just be aware that people are really targeting some of those things. But yes, you're right. When you say this is this is what it looks like to work here. This is what respectful looks like. This is what, you know, those parts are important to do as your culture. And then just being aware that there's case law that's that some of these things have actually happened and just being just knowing that it's out there because you're right we're like that's ridiculous why would, why would this be okay it wouldn't but for some way there's some wiggle room that people use these loopholes to be able to do that so um i was reading this too and i'm like yeah yep i remember that case law and you know just some of these things where just it gets so into the weeds that that's why having flexibility with your handbooks and your policies able to do that but yeah it's the, <laughs> on the uh if you have cameras you are required to notify your employees that you have cameras on the property so make sure that's in your handbook yeah that was a new one mm -hmm. yeah. where can they find more information about the legal protections that are being talked about here uh sherm is a good one sherm had a lot of stuff but if they're not a member of sherm um the nlrb is going to be your best NLRB, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of times, like the local chapters, like the Columbia Basin Sh Sherm chapter, the Yakima Valley um, YVHRA chapters, and sometimes some of these conferences, it's always nice to go and, and hear the, um, they'll have an attorney come in and speak on just some basic 101 tech things. And this is where I learned a lot of the case law. They're like, they got away with that? They could do that? Like, And it just kind of shows you be aware of some of these things uh, because uh, it kind of helps you maneuver through your own organization and how to handle some of these things. I'm George, um, George Seacott comes and speaks, uh, asks the experts, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, he also speaks at SHRM a lot on the new labor laws and all that kind of stuff. So he's really good to talk about. And a lot of that stuff is cultural. Oh, I'm sorry. Because if you stop it here, yes. rarely would you get to here. Absolutely. But you can't let all what you permit, you promote, right? Exactly. So you can't let all this stuff happen and then all of a sudden clamp down. Right. Because that's where you'll get into trouble with those things. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like uh, setting up rules for teenagers. Probably should have done that when they were younger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I just had a comment on like some of the like social media or preventing or using a smartphone or recording things. But you also want to think about your industry. Um, in the legal field, you sh we should def we definitely have to have policies around social media because we cannot be posting confidential client information. We yeah. can't be talking about client cases and things like that. And so we have to really train our employees that you can't be posting about, oh, I worked on this case today or I did this and this and this. Um, they can't do that because yeah. that that's uh, they're would be breaching that attorney client, yeah. you know, uh, confidentiality. So we have to train a lot in that area. Um, and if same goes with like recording things or whatever, we have to be very careful because we would be violating that. So so we do have a little bit of restrictions around those things. Yeah, that's a really good point because the uh, on social media, I was going to say this earlier and I lost my thought was on social media if they are actually. Um, doing something like that, like violating um, attorney client privilege or a HIPAA law, or they are, um, so they're violating some type of law, or they are ruining the reputation of the employer, you can do something about that. Or if they're bullying or harassing another employee online, um, I've actually terminated an employee for harassing and bullying another employee online um, on social media. And so you can do that. And the other thing I was going to add, and I missed this in a slide somewhere, was arbitration agreement. Make sure that somewhere in your employee handbook, you have an arbitration agreement. So I cannot tell you how many times an arbitration agreement has saved um, employers from getting a class action lawsuit on whether it be mileage for drivers or uh, whatever it may be. It might be overtime, but what happens with the arbitration agreement is that it narrows it down that only that employee can sue. They can't do a class action. And so it has saved an employer many, many of times having the arbitration agreement and they have to go through arbitration before they can do anything else. In, in the um, handbook or the policy? Pardon me? In the handbook? 
Yeah, I put it in the handbook. Yeah, and I do a separate doc. Um, so I'll do the acknowledgement at the end of the handbook, the arbitration agreement, and I require a signature on the arbitration agreement and on the acknowledgement. But I have also seen handbooks where they'll require signatures like in different sections of the handbook on different things. You don't need to do that. You need to just have the acknowledgement that they received the handbook. The arbitration agreement, I was advised by an attorney at one point to um, have the signature on the arbitration agreement because it is such a big deal for the employer. And so that's why I started doing the two, the two separate, but they, you know, you put in a DocuSign. If you don't have a system, the other thing to do is do it through DocuSign. You know, this employer that I'm working with right now doing some interim stuff is, you know, they're printing everything out still. And I'm like, well, well until we get a system, why don't we use, at least have DocuSign and just have them fill out everything through DocuSign. Are you aware of any employers in the, well, I guess, public or private sector, wouldn't matter, that have it stated in there that they agree that they will only do arbitration in-house and not take it out you know, whatever the settlement is in-house. Like, for, for example, I work for a, a large uh, home improvement company that that was in their uh, hiring agreement, mm -hmm. that if we had a labor or some kind of concern, we agreed to handle it in-house and not have it leave there, not have it be adjudicated outside of the corporation. And that was, yes. they, they were a big home improvement company, mm -hmm. and that was, uh, you know, flat up in, in their stuff. So it must be legal. It is legal um, for them to do that. They can either designate a, uh, I've seen a couple of things. I've seen where you can have an appeals process. It goes to the CEO and that if that doesn't work. Then they can file for arbitration. Um, and basically they go to an attorney, they get the arbitration. Um, usually they, in the arbitration agreement, you have to designate whether it's a in-house, but it has to be a fair person. It has to be a neutral person. So usually they designate a uh, company um, there's like American Arbitration Association, is that what it is? The AAA. Um, and they designate that that's who they're going to use. Um, and it's, uh, do you know a lot about arbitration there's agreements too? too? Yeah. So there's a couple of different places that you can use that are, um, and so they do have to designate in that. They can't just say it's the corporation because then they're going to be biased to the decision, right? Yeah. So I wonder if they were using like a, but I mean, they were probably assigning one of those companies to the. I would think it would have to. Yeah. It didn't say anything about that. But as when I first read that and saw that, that boy, you know, that tips the scales in their favor so much. Yeah. So it had to be. Arbitration agreements do tip in the employer's favor. But without that outsider, yeah. it really tips. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that would be legal. I would think an attorney would be all Usually over the that. third party and it's a certified third party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it good to have an attorney look over your handbook? Yes, for sure. I even, even though I, I do so many handbooks, I always tell them to have an attorney look over the handbook. However, the language and stuff that I use is, um, I've had an attorney look over. So I have that and I tell them, I'm like, my, I've had an attorney look over the language that I use for your handbook, but you should still have an attorney look at it. And it just depends on your attorney if you take your attorney's advice too, because sometimes they'll end up making it so much more than it needs to be. And they add words that don't need to be in there and add sections that don't need to be in there. So it's up to you whether you take their advice or not. Because then they get too attorney-ish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other HR policies you must have? That would be a pitfall that some companies have not had and they got tripped up. I don't know that there's any must-have policies. I mean, your general policies that I would have is a drug, drug-free workplace policy, a harassment policy, an absolute must mm -hmm. for every organization. Um, Probably along with that retaliation, too. but it kind of goes with that. Yeah, the harassment, sexual harassment, retaliation. You do with your harassment have to have a grievance process or a um, reporting process with your policy. Um, but those are the only two that I would say that are like, make sure those are in there. Yeah. Make sure you have those. Yeah. And when you have, usually when you have like an anti-harassment, you want to, there's some kind of process in there about 
regular training. So every other year, once a year, again, keep it flexible. So you're not like committing if Casey miss a year, uh, but keep it flexible and have regular trainings for your supervisors and how they should handle when, when it's reported to you. And then for the line staff or employees so that they know how to report as well. And it's really clear. So it's like, I didn't know what to do. And so I just kept getting harassed. It's that way it's, it's something that you're able to look at as an employee handbook and then be able to follow that process. I actually would also say a social media policy with Tiffany because mm. it's hard to do anything if you don't have a social media policy if they start posting stuff on social media, especially if your harassment policy doesn't cover social media. A training uh, like this that I was at a few months ago talked about in the bullying and harassment and sexual harassment area. They now you need to include a statement that says if you file knowingly file false charges that you can be disciplined up to termination because there seems to be a, a rise of false charges and that kind of reverse harassment, I guess that's mm -hmm. what I put it. Yeah. So we were encouraged to have a statement in there that's, that says that to protect you know, a person. That's a good idea. Because people in some places can make up the charge, ruin a person, yeah. and they suffer no consequences from it. Yeah. It just, it helps protect everybody. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely add that language. Yeah, we we added that in our totally ruined somebody's reputation because you were mad. Yeah, <laughs> you wanted to report something. Mm -hmm. Yes. What's the latest in rules for calling for a reference? Uh, so a lot of people don't know this, but there is a uh, rule out there that if you knowingly, so say you have an employee that uh, physically assaulted another employee whether it be male, female, whether it be a fist fight, whether it be sexual assault, if you or if you know that they, I can't remember what the verbiage is for it. It's uh, there's a there's a term used for it, but it's basically that you knew that this employee did something illegal in the workplace and you don't report it to um, the somebody for a reference that you have you could have some liability around that. But it has to be factual and it has to be something that was illegal. Um, and you, it can't be that you were suspecting that your CFO was stealing money. It had to be that you actually pressed charges and your CEO was CFO was stealing money. I don't, there's a, um, there's the word, it's yeah. A, yeah. So there are some, and a lot of people just don't say anything at all, but you do have some legal, legal liability if there's been some, uh, something, some illegal activity. Um, otherwise, I don't know, it's up to the employer. I always, I don't know. Yeah, that one's always a 50-50, but yeah. yes, I, I learned about that rule about if it was something illegal and you don't say anything, they come back like, well, Laura said they were awesome. Yeah, because I wanted them out of here. You know, yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> and then the thing did that she knew they did this. You yeah, know, they still tell me. They still tell me. But yeah, he's great. Take him. So yes, there's liability on our agency yeah. for doing that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. On the references, I've had some companies where they're like, we'll give references for employees. And there's some like, we only verify employment. There's four things that we say. Yes, they worked here. Yes or no, they're rehirable. This was their title and this was their dates of employment. And that's all we say. And so organizations take that stance and then they can ask coworkers, supervisors. Um, I had a company say, yes, as a supervisor of this person who's asking for a reference, give them a, a reference, but you represent yourself, not the company. So sometimes they want to take that that stance away. Uh, and some were like, yeah, we'll give references to our employees. So it just really, it really depends. That's the only concern is if they did something illegal and you're like, oh, they're great. And they find out that you knew uh, and you said they were great, then that's. The, the thing that you have to be careful of is that if you give references for one person and you don't for another, that you're not discriminating. Like it really comes down to protected class. Are you not giving references for all the black people or all the Hispanic people or all the white people? Like if you're discriminating against that. Now, if you don't give a reference to somebody because they were not a good employee, but you it's not the same race that you keep doing it to or the same age group or something like that, then you're not doing anything wrong by giving a reference. Would you agree? I would agree. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I like to give references because especially for good employees, but I've had people that have asked me or that have I like get a notice from someone asking for a reference and I'm like, 
I didn't get that email. Delete. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've had to say, girl, you can't make it to work on time. I'm not going to tell an employee you're great. <laughs> like, you know, it's kind of just yeah. kind of real for somebody like that. Mm -hmm. But yes, I love to give references because if they're trying to move up in their career, they're trying to, you know, switch it up, find an organization, and they were awesome. I'd love to give give that out. But I know employers get a little like, uh, we don't do it for this one. And then, yeah. So it just really I've depends. never heard of an employer getting sued for not for giving a reference, giving a reference. Mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. Back to the social media policy. Anything else that needs to be in that? But there were also some warnings in that one slide about don't be too stringent about it. <clears throat> yeah, you, you can't the prevent them from it's only if they're if they're in a group and they're talking with one or more employees that you can't keep them from talking about wage hours or working conditions. Okay. The other stuff is your policy should really be around uh, who can post on social media on behalf of the company, who can, if you're representing the company, can they represent the company or can they not? Um, like if, if, if there's an event. So if there's an event, can they share it on their page? Probably, but if there's event, an event, can they actually go to their page and set up an event? kind of those types of guidelines around that policy. Okay. And then also, you know, what happens if they're bullying or harassing or they're um, uh, talking about the reputation of the company. And then just a general guideline of asking them to get permission to post about the company. Um, it doesn't mean that you can always get that, but you can set that expectation that that's what you would like. It goes back to that flexible language. Give that employee that flexibility as well as having that flexibility. Because most of the time, the employee is going to do the right thing. They're going to ask first. Exit interviews. Is it still a thing? Any guidelines on that? <laughs> it is still a thing. It's still a thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, like, I like to do the exit interviews, but it depends who's doing them, right? So if you have HR doing the exit interview, um, sometimes that's helpful, but if you have the supervisor doing the exit interview, if you know the stats, 80 some percent of people leave because of their manager. So I don't know how truthful that's going to be to an employee leaving. Uh, so if HR or some more of a neutral party is doing, I think it's, it's helpful. Um, but I really, really have been getting into the state interviews, right? You get somebody in, they're brand new, they're in their 30 days and you're like, How's it going? You got some basic questions that you want to run through. Do you think you have everything that you need? Do you have the tools? What could you, what could have done better with the process? You know, like you're, you're asking to get better at the process, but also checking in on them to see if they're likely to stay and you check in a little bit later, you get that one year and you're just constantly checking in. Sometimes the state interview, you're finding out more information before someone leaves versus at the exit. You know, why they're saying that they leave, but a lot of people want to leave a good term. So if they do have something to say, they're like, yeah, it was good thanks for having me here. And then later, like, oh my God, it was just crazy. The workload was, you know, atrocious or whatever it is. And it's not always honest, but it is helpful to get the exit interviews. But I do also like to add the state interviews in there just to get what is happening at the time before someone leaves. So potentially you can pivot if you need to. And if they don't want to do it, sometimes I'll mail it to them anyway. I'll mail them a document. And then sometimes I get them back. Mm -hmm. but sometimes I don't. I put a return envelope with stamp on it. Sometimes after they leave, then they get mad and then we like, or they want to be nice. They're like, oh, I think I'll do something, you know. Yeah, my boss was great. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Last question. If certification isn't important, <laughs> what, what would you recommend for getting better in HR, in the Ex field of HR? Experience. Experience. Mm -hmm. Big thing. I mean, if you're new to HR, the certification may help, but I don't know. I mean, I think. If you can shadow somebody that has a lot of HR experience, I had an intern one time that uh, she was taking a labor relations class and I was in the middle of negotiations. So I was like, hey, do you want to go down to negotiation with me and like sit there for a day and you can check it out? She's like, I learned more in one day than I did in a whole year of college. <laughs> and so I just think, you know, being able to shadow somebody that has a lot of experience and just being in a job with somebody that wants to help you. I, a lot of times people hire HR assistants that don't have any HR background and then they don't know what they don't know. Um, so reaching out to somebody, I'm sure Laura or myself, I mean, go to LinkedIn, you reach out to us. We'd probably sit there and talk to you for hours about HR um, and different ways to learn. I, I don't want to like say that they shouldn't do the certification, but I just also feel like, Certification. How much does it cost? And aren't there two necessary. different levels? 
there's the, the senior the senior and by the time you if you take the class and you get the books and everything in fact i just met with sherm on this um and you get the books and if you take a class if the class has to be they have to teach like 13 hours or something in the class and then you get the books that's like twelve hundred dollars that's if for both of that and then you still have to pay for the exam which i think is like 400 bucks mm -hmm. so it's around 1600 dollars altogether or you could just buy the books and study the books itself are around 800 900 dollars and then the yeah. exam cost but yeah i agree with the experience piece like there's um just things that you can read about it and there's scenarios but until like my very first termination uh gentleman threw a purse at me Okay, that you don't you read don't read that in books. <laughs> That's not in the short book. But how do you like address these things? Should this person have been in there? Why was the person on the table? All kinds of things, right? But you learn all these things through experience. That the Sherman certification, it's going to give you just some kind of ideas and generalizations, and you've got some information, you got some background. That's always great to have. But to get the real scenarios, because nothing happens the same thing twice. Like every term, I've never had it go, go the same. Um, every discipline, every investigation, every everything is different, and you only learn that I through don't think experience. Talk about investigations, I don't think so. For like maybe union investigation. The other yeah. thing is, is like I look back, and the only thing I even remember from all of that was uh, the interview effects, like the halo effect. Yes, someone Recency like you, yeah, and like the different effects that interview people have. Like if you come in with baseball, like, you know, a 49er hat, and I'm a 49er fan. Now I have a bias towards you because we have something in common. Um, so I remember that, and I also remember the Warren Act. Like if you have so many employees, you have to that you're going to lay off. You have to notify them within like if it's over a certain number. Like those are the only things I even remember. The other thing about the certification is that the laws are changing so fast mm -hmm. that within four to five years, the certification doesn't even. Wow. Well. Going to get some money. Like a lot of the laws that are in there, like the best practices may be effective, but if you're reading leadership books, you know, best practices are not applying. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, experience, these types of workshops, webinars, um, and then yes. if you can shadow or get a mentor of just somebody that can talk to you for a little bit about certain things, that goes a long way too. So, well, let's thank our experts today for donating their time. <laughs> And Renette's information was on that slide. It's also on the bottom of the handout um, that she provided on employee handbook contents. And Laura's card is in the back uh, if you want to grab that uh, to contact them. Again, the slides will be emailed to you if you're here or on Zoom. And the, the video today will be placed on YouTube uh, also. We also want to thank STCU. Thanks again, Tim, for sponsoring Ask the Experts, making it free to participate. Uh, both of our speakers have donated uh, something, so we have two business cards in there, so one for each of you. Do so you guys so, have business cards? No more business cards. Oh, I'm going to throw them in. Throw them in. Throw them in there. I'll, just, I'll do a real shuffle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I should probably put it in there. I'll just put it in there. All right, all right. All right. All right. Okay. Sorry. So, Renee, you are donating. I am doing a free handbook review, and then if you decide that you want to get your handbook updated, two hundred dollars off. Okay, and that is for Jolene. Can, can Jolene, we um, Jolene. Uh, <laughs> assign it to somebody else? You sure? Okay. Okay. Very okay. cool. So trade information there, and then Laura, you are oh, donating. Yeah, back. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I am doing one hour of free training on the long list of trainings that I do. It could be communication, leadership, emotional intelligence, nice. anti-harassment, whatever the thing is, an hour. Nice. And that is for Angelina. Yay. Yay. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. So thank you for joining that. Would you please do us a favor and fill out the survey? Um, and leave, just leave that at your table. You can just flip it over if you want to get the QR code. If you're on Zoom, we would love to get the survey from you so uh, we can make these even more extremely valuable and you'll attend again and tell your business colleagues to join us. Um, I left the tool in the back also on onboarding tips on the back counter and we'll get those emailed to those that watch on Zoom. And our next one, is on it's always on the fourth uh, Tuesday of the month. Ask the experts from three to four thirty. The next one is on November twenty eighth. It is going to be change your mind, change your health, change your leadership. So overcoming uh, 
stress in leadership. We need some good stress, but we're talking about the bad stress there. And so we've got three great uh, health and wellness coaches that are going to be with us on November 28th. So I hope you'll join us again. May your businesses continue to prosper in quarter four of 2023. <laughs> Thank you again for coming. Billy, you can just talk to us.